As the government sacks one of its own members, Paul Bristow, for calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, we'll be asking if the consensus is breaking down. Meanwhile, a mosque chairman who praised the Hamas founder has been advising the Crown Prosecution Service on hate crimes. Are there extremist sleepers amongst us? As Britain finds itself in the midst of record levels of legal migration, the Telegraph has reported that internal Home Office documents suggest foreign worker visas are set to double over the next five years. Why are we not taking back control? And we're always told that the younger generation is intent on solving the so-called climate crisis, but a new poll has suggested that it's the older generation who do more for the environment than anyone else, on all counts of recycling, energy saving, flights and insulation, while the young Thunbergians are trailing behind the obedient pensioners. Plus, a coup has taken place in Norway, not a military, political or revolutionary coup, but a coup relating to cheese. In spite of the evidence that British cheese is the best, a Norwegian cheese has swooped in and stolen first prize at the World Cheese Awards. State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by an intellectual panel this evening, the editor of Conservative Home and former Tory MP Paul Goodman and the former advisor to Jeremy Corbyn, James Schneider. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now it's time for the news of the day with Aaron Armstrong. Very good evening to you. The Israeli Prime Minister says there will be no ceasefire in Gaza and that this is a time for war. Benjamin Netanyahu promised to stand against the forces of barbarism until victory is achieved describing Hamas, uh, a part of an axis of evil, being formed by Iran. He added, even the most just wars have unintended civilian casualties. More than 8,000 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli bombing, according to the Gaza Health Ministry. Uh, Mr Netanyahu has described October the 7th as a turning point. Israel will not agree to a cessation of hostilities with Hamas after the horrific attacks of October 7th. Calls for a ceasefire are calls for Israel to surrender to Hamas, to surrender to terrorism, to surrender to barbarism. That will not happen. The Israeli government has also confirmed 14 British nationals were among those murdered during the Hamas attacks on the 7th of October. Two others are still missing and may still be hostages in Gaza. Meanwhile, the Israeli Defence Forces say a female soldier has been rescued from Gaza. Private Ori Megadish was freed during a ground operation against Hamas and has been reunited with her family. Hamas, meanwhile, has posted a video of three hostages being held asking for a Palestinian prisoner swap. Their relatives have said the proof of life has given them hope. A Conservative MP has been sacked from his government job after publicly urging Rishi Sunak to back a permanent ceasefire in Gaza. At Downing Street, says Paul Bristow, a ministerial aide in the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology, made comments that aren't consistent with the principles of collective responsibility. Meanwhile, Labour suspended Andy MacDonald, claiming comments he made about the war were deeply offensive. The MP for Middlesbrough used the controversial phrase between the river and the sea in a speech during a po pro-Palestinian demonstration at the weekend. Well, the Home Secretary has described pro-Palestinian protests across the U uh, UK as hate marches. Uh, earlier today, the government and police held an emergency COBRA meeting to discuss the threat of terrorism linked to the Israel-Hamas conflict. The meeting follows a rise in anti-Semitic and Islamophobic incidents across the country since October the 7th. In other news, the police officer charged with murder following the fatal shooting of Chris Cabo will be named publicly. The officer's name and date of birth will be made public on the 30th of January. Their home address or any image cannot be published. Mr Cabo died when he was shot through the windscreen of a car in South East London last year. And Just Stop Oil activists who climbed a motorway gantry on the M25 have avoided jail. Two protesters were handed suspended sentences after a High Court judge found organisers of the demonstration did not make them aware of the injunction. Uh, no penalties were imposed against any of the other 10 activists. The ruling uh, comes after 62 Just Stop Oil protesters were arrested at a demonstration in London.
Well, this is GB News on TV, on digital radio and on your smart speaker too. That's it for me. Now, it's back to Jacob. MI5 is institutionally, publicly racist. It discriminates against 92.6% of my constituents in North East Somerset. If you're poor, if you've been failed by the education system, if, as with James Bond, you're an orphan, don't apply to MI5. It won't have you as an intern if you're white. This is one of several cases of institutional racism in our institutions that State of the Nation has found. You would hope that our intelligence agencies would be intelligent. The old joke that military intelligence is an oxymoron turns out to be true, and they're just woke. MI5 offers racist summer internships. The website states an internship at MI5 is like no other. That's quite true. It's a racist internship. It's a challenge that calls for individuals from a range of backgrounds with different skills and knowledge. A range of backgrounds, unless, of course, you're part of the 96.2% of North East Somerset that is white. This is an internship that is exclusively for people who are not white, and it explicitly says so. To be eligible to apply for the Summer Intelligence Internship, you must answer yes to the below questions. I'm from one of the following black, Asian or minority ethnic backgrounds, Bangladeshi, Indian, Pakistani, Chinese or other Asian background, African, Caribbean or any other black background, white and Asian, white and black African, white and black Caribbean or any other mixed ethnic background, other minority ethnic group. So in other words, MI5 now hires its interns on the basis of race and ethnicity. And it does so with your taxpayer money. It uses your money to discriminate against most of the population. And the great irony of this is that it purports to serve the disadvantaged. But in ruling out the white population, it is completely neglecting white socioeconomically disadvantaged people. The group that the chairman of the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, Tony Sewell, identified as a particularly underprivileged group. It may not surprise you to know that MI5 is not the only culprit. The Civil Services Summer Internship includes being non-white as part of its eligibility criteria. The Bank of England's Black Future Leaders Sponsorship Programme is, quote, looking for students from a black slash black heritage, including mixed. The London Mayor's Office has in the past had internships for ethnic minorities too. And Transport for London offers a communications internship for which, quote, you must be of black, Asian and minority ethnic background defined as having some African, Afro-Caribbean, Asian or other non-white heritage. So it appears Britain's public sector has been overrun with institutional racism, undoing all of the progress we have made with Britain's race relations over the past half century and you pay for it. And why does this matter? Well, it matters because it's unfair to the least well-off, not just in my constituency, but in constituencies across the country. And if we want to have good race relations, which we do, and we want to accept that fundamental equality, that principle of equality of all British citizens, then all discrimination is wrong. It's wrong when it's against minorities, but it's also wrong when it's against the majority population. I'm joined now by the director of the Free Speech Union, Toby Young. Toby, how have we got into this situation where a Conservative government for 13 years is allowing its intelligence service to discriminate against 92.6%, 96.2% of my electors? It's shocking. Um, uh, uh, imagine if it was the other way around, Jacob, and the intelligence services were saying only white people can apply for our summer internships. There would be absolute uproar. They'd be prosecuted under equalities legislation, and rightly so. So why on earth do they think it's perfectly acceptable for them to discriminate, but in, on the other way? Well, let me say, tell you what MI5 says. It says, the summer intelligence internship is a lawful measure used by the intelligence agencies to encourage people from underrepresented groups to consider careers with our organisation. Participants in the internship do not receive an offer of permanent employment at the end of it. Anyone who has participated in the internship and who wishes to apply for a permanent position can do so. They will compete against all other candidates and external recruitment processes. The thing that annoys me about that is that constituents in North East Somerset are underrepresented in the security services. Um, just inevitably, because it is um, a London-focused, based organisation. We looked after at the Free Speech Union, a woman who worked for the Department of Work and Pensions, and she was asked to organise for um, people in Plymouth, where she worked as a case officer, uh, an, an open day organised by the Metropolitan Police. We're trying to recruit, but they said white men weren't welcome at this open day. And, of course, the vast majority of her clients in a 
particularly deprived part of Plymouth, were white men. She kicked up a fuss. She said, I think this is discriminatory. This is effectively a form of racism. And she was um, uh, investigated for gross misconduct and eventually fired. We got, we got behind her, we got some good lawyers, and eventually she got a settlement for £100,000 and a finding of unfair dismissal. But this kind of thing is happening all over the public sector. And it's a problem with the Equalities Act that actually allows this to happen. So instead of being, I mean, it, it's um, newspeak, isn't it, that intel instead of being in favour of equalities, it supports discrimination. It's, um, it, it, they've got this um, loophole in the Equality Act whereby positive discrimination is unlawful, but positive action is lawful. And this would fall under the heading, I think, the intelligence services would argue, of positive action, not positive discrimination, because they're not actually discriminating against people they're giving full-time jobs for, only people they're giving but internships they're for. But if, if the boot was on the other foot and it was positive action in favour of white people, then you'll bet your bottom dollar it would fall foul of it. But equality. they are paying these interns and they're providing them with accommodation. It's um, uh, remunerative. Yes, and presumably if you've done an internship um, at MI5, then it's a lot easier to get a full-time position at the end of it. I mean, well, that's, I, that's I the certainly, entire purpose. I, I certainly found in my business that we often employed interns because you had a good idea of who they were. Anyway, I'm now delighted to be joined by Gillian Howard, employment law and consultant with Leighton's LLP. Um, thank you very much for joining me. Could you explain the background to the law in this and what the law is trying to achieve? Yes, I have to say I disagree with both of you very strongly. The Equality Act 2010 allows for positive action where there are underrepresented groups, disadvantaged groups, such as ethnic minorities. And it provides that employers are entitled to offer training only to the underrepresented, for example, minority ethnic groups, um, and also to offer them employment if they are as qualified as someone who is not of an ethnic minority. And if you think about it, my son actually suggested this. He's an ex met police officer. And he pointed out that recruits from historically minority communities, if they are engaged, uh, trained and, and, and engaged by MI5 and the other security services after that training, they could be very useful given the nature and profile of the terrorist threats that we've faced in recent years. And there's an urgent need for intelligence assets from... Yeah, but they, they, they can recruit people community. on merit. If they need good people who can go undercover in certain communities, um, that's something that they can do in an ordinary employment sense. But they're discriminating against people in my constituency who are underrepresented, particularly from places like Radstock or Peasdown, which have significant levels of deprivation in them. No, they are not discriminating against They are, because they, they can't but get this internship. They are They're banned from applying. The law allows... That the law allows, but just because the law allows doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. Uh, black and ethnic minority uh, individuals have been discriminated against. Poor people from North East Somerset are discriminated and against. And, and now they're discriminated against more. No, they're not being discriminated They are, because they can't the law, get this internship. The law, the law allows for positive action, as Toby Young said. Yes, but the law is and an act. That is what it is. As so well, often. Well, that's your view. Thank goodness that the uh, lawmakers have not considered that the Equality Act 2010, sections 158 and 159, which allow for this and allow for positive action and allow to help underrepresented, disadvantaged minorities to get advantages, to level the equal... The, the, but it's the not level, level because the 96.2% of my constituents who are white cannot apply for these, even if they're poor, even if they've had an education that has let them down, even if, as I said earlier, like James Bond, they are orphans and have had a difficult start in life. They're discriminated against by a law that is an ass. No, I totally disagree with you. The law provides that underrepresented minorities... Yeah, you've said that, but why is this women, right? Why is this moral? Because it is right and moral. Those why? Who have been why is it right to discriminate? And dis those who have been discriminated against in the past and are, are not on a level playing field with, for example, white individuals or white males are being given a chance by the law to be trained and then given an opportunity where they haven't so had opportunity You're before. basically saying two wrongs make a right. No, I'm not saying two wrongs make a you right. You are, because you're That's saying all. past discrimination justifies future discrimination. 
No, I'm not saying that because I don't agree with you. It is what you said. That. Anyway, thank you, Julian, for joining me. I've still got with that. me um, from the Free Speech it's Union, speech. Toby Young. So it's absolutely fine because they were discriminated against in the past, and therefore let's discriminate against the good people of North East Somerset. Um, white working class boys have been discriminated against in the past. Why can't they apply for these internships? The internships, the point you made. Uh, one thing that we're overlooking in this, okay. Jacob, is Sorry, that black start? and minority ethnic people themselves Hello? resent this kind of favourable treatment. It's patronising to say we have to lower the bar and create special opportunities for them, otherwise they won't get these jobs if they have to compete on a level playing field. And when they do get the jobs, they think that everyone else around them assumes they only got the job because of the colour of their skin. They dismiss them secretly as a diversity hire. Um, and whether American statistics or anything to go by or not, I don't know. But they indicate very strongly that people from Asian backgrounds outperform in all these employment um, opportunities anyway. Absolutely. And in America, affirmative action enjoys less support amongst African Americans it, than it does amongst female white Democrats. I taught at an American Ivy League college, quite a liberal Ivy League college, and we were talking about whether positive discrimination can ever be justified. And at the beginning of the discussion, I said, put your hand up if you're in favour of it. All the white kids in the class put their hands up. The only three who objected to it were the three black kids in the class. Because they feel, as you say, that they're patronised and that people will think they haven't got their own merit and that their promotion is not deserved. Yeah, they don't want their competitors to be hobbled. They want to compete on a level playing field. Otherwise, the prize isn't worth the having. But also, we want to have in this country, don't we, good race relations. And that requires the majority of the population to feel that things are fair. And this is so demonstrably unfair. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, the, the fundamental problem with all these efforts to tackle long-standing historical racial discrimination is, instead of urging people to judge applicants on the content of their character, their credentials, how they perform in the interview and the entrance exam, by urging them to judge them on the colour of their skin, they're creating these racially divided workplaces. They're sowing the seeds of racial resentment. Which is really unfortunate because this country actually has a very good record on race relations, much better than some of our comparator nations. Much better. I mean, it's one of the least racist countries in the world. Often the premise of these kinds of schemes is that these institutions are, are um, uh, hidebound by institutional racism um, and, that, and that we need to make an enormous effort to overcome these historic injustices, whereas, in fact, we are one of the least racist countries in the world, which is why so many black and minority ethnic people want to come here. So why is... A Home Secretary as good, as capable and as fair as Suella allowing an organisation under her department to behave in this discriminatory and racist way? Um, I imagine that um, it's quite difficult to get the civil servants to do much about it. She probably doesn't want to pick a fight with the security services, particularly at this particular time when they're under a lot of pressure, I imagine, trying to nip in the bud terrorist plots. By well, if they focus on that rather than discriminating against my constituents, <laughs> it might be better. I agree. Thank you very much, Toby. I think this is disgraceful. Don't forget to let me know your thoughts, mailmog at gbnews.com. Coming up next, are there extremist sleepers among us in Britain? Plus, we'll be discussing why younger people don't put their money where their mouth is on climate change. Perhaps it's not their money. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. 
People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 pm, Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB, on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. I'm still Jacob Rees-Mogg and this is Still State of the Nation. And you've been getting in touch with your thoughts. Kathleen, in light of your revelations about MI5, can white people refuse to pay their taxes? I thought it was illegal to discriminate because of the colour of their skin. I think that's a really good point. I think you should raise that with the Treasury. Um, Peter, I wish there were a legal way that I could direct to some extent just where my tax is put to use. And Diana, this positive discrimination must stop because we must have those with the best skills and performance and attitude doing these jobs. How do we know that MI5 will not then be infiltrated by spies, by other nations or interest groups? Well, if they employed more people from North East Somerset, they would have people who definitely wouldn't become spies or do dangerous things like that. Anyway, a couple of hours ago, a ministerial aide, Paul Bristow, was sacked by the Prime Minister for breaching the principles of collective responsibility when he called for a ceasefire in Gaza, in contradiction to the government's position of humanitarian pauses. Does this mean the consensus of support for Israel is breaking? Meanwhile, over the weekend, it was revealed that a mosque chairman who had praised the Hamas founder had also been advising the Crown Prosecution Service on hate crimes, perhaps begging the question of whether he would turn himself in. And this, along with many other instances of extremism we've seen on Britain's streets recently, poses questions of whether there are extremist sleepers amongst us. Well, joining me now is my panel, editor of Conservative Home and former Tory MP Paul Goodman, and the former advisor to Jeremy Corbyn, James Snyder. James, can I come to you first of all on this issue uh, of a ceasefire? Because obviously a lot of members of the Labour Party have called for it. Do you think that is the right thing to go do? And does it show deep divisions within both political parties? It's absolutely the right thing to do because uh, anyone can see that you don't respond to the unjustifiable killing of one group of children by killing many, many more children on the other side. It doesn't make any sense, which is why the overwhelming majority of people in Britain want to see a ceasefire, 76% in a YouGov poll. And that's inevitably putting a lot of pressure on MPs, particularly Labour MPs, but also on some Conservative MPs whose constituents are getting in touch with them by whatever means they can to say, please, will you pursue the course of peace? And this is causing trouble, uh, you know, deep trouble for the Labour front bench, for Keir Starmer, who's taking a position which is against what the overwhelming majority of people in Britain want. But doesn't everyone want peace? but that Israel must have the right to try and remove the terrorists and that a ceasefire merely allows Hamas to regroup and to um, hide itself amongst the civilian po population in Gaza even more. Israel does not have the right to flatten Gaza. Already 50% of homes in Gaza are either destroyed or severely damaged. This is not a surgical attack against terrorists or anything like that. This is the mass assault 
on the people of Gaza. We've already seen over 3,000 children die. And very clearly, there is no path to peace which runs through the further destruction of Gaza. There are quite intense war crimes that are taking place. And what uh, British politicians should be doing, given that Britain is a key ally of Israel and we also provide them with arms and, and other weaponry, is to push them to cease the bombardment of Gaza and go for a ceasefire. That's the only way forward for both the Palestinian people and also for the long-term security of people in Israel, because the underlying cause, the underlying issue of this conflict is the decades-long dispossession of the Palestinian people. Paul, what's your answer to that? Well, my answer to that is very simple, which is that no one can impose a ceasefire on Hamas which is the side of the equation that's not discussed, because Hamas is not going to stop firing rockets. So a ceasefire in practice means only one side to carry out the ceasefire, namely the Israelis. And that's really not durable, because if the Israelis do that, which I'm convinced they would like to do, they got out of Gaza in 2005, they don't have anything to do with the place, but Hamas keep firing these rockets into Israel. So the Israelis have to do something. And the difficulty they've got is this is asymmetric warfare because Hamas have dispersed themselves among the population because for Hamas, civilians, hey, they're part of the pawn in their game. So I don't think it's nearly as simple as calling for a ceasefire because it, it doesn't solve the fundamental and, and, and that's right, because Hamas has fired hundreds of rockets since the attacks on the 7th of October. Uh, which have had basically zero impact. Israel has... Well, they're the, killing people. That's quite a big it, it, impact. Israel has the most incredible defence system. The, the Iron Dome... But Paul's hold, right. Hold on, Paul's please. right. A one-way ceasefire... No, hold, hold. Firstly, Hamas hasn't, show, hasn't said that they wouldn't accept a ceasefire, so I think we should be put... Look, oh, they, come on. But, well, hold on. But they, but, but they haven't. And in times past, uh, Hamas has sought uh, ceasefires of, of different things. So, firstly, let's try... To, also, Britain is close, uh, very close diplomatic allies to Turkey, a NATO member, and Qatar, who, are, who have relationships with Hamas. So, if we want to do so we can apply some pressure there. Now, uh, the, the scale of attack is almost entirely in one direction. But that's Paul's point, uh, asymmetric warfare. No, no, no. no. But, the, but, but how can Israel have a symmetric attack to a terrorist attack from people hiding in a population when it's a full-blown state? It can't. So you can't say that because these people can only fire these these little rockets which our Iron Dome can shoot down, therefore... But it doesn't shoot down all oh, of them, oh, does there, it? Therefore we have to the only solution can be killing more children. I mean, Jacob, just stop for a moment. Just, just, let's just take it back one second. How on earth does it make sense to respond to the killing of one group of children by wiping out entire families, thousands of children, utterly flattening Gaza? If they've done more than half of the homes in this place. This is a small place. I'm not quite sure how large North East Somerset is, but Gaza is 10 kilometres wide. This is a tiny place, hugely densely populated, which is being raised to rubble. And that's your point, Paul, isn't it? It's asymmetric warfare. Before, but... before October the 7th, I, I think the conventional thinking in Israel, America and the UK was maybe Hamas wanted truce. In fact, the Israelis were on the verge of trying to open up their border to let more people in with work, for, for work permits. That's not what Hamas wanted. Hamas wanted pretty clearly to derail the Abraham Accords, hence their terror attack. So I'm very critical of the Israelis in certain senses. I don't think they should be doing what they're doing on the West Bank. And I am wondering if there's a durable military purpose to what they're doing. But they've got a right to try and do something. And it's Hamas who began this round of the killings with utterly barbarous murders that you know, some people in Britain, I'm afraid, are denying happened at all. And that's the issue, that there are some extremists in Britain who seem to be acting as apologists for, for Hamas this chap with the Crown Prosecution Service. That must be worrying, that you've got people with serious senior positions within the government's legal system who actually have made statements backing a terrorist organisation. Well, I, I actually know a little bit about Mohammed Kosbar because I, I've met him many times. He's the chair of Finsbury Park Mosque. I've been to, at interfaith meetings with him. I've seen him in action within the mosque, and he seems, in everything that I've seen, a thoroughly decent and upstanding person. Except he backs a terrorist organisation. Well, no, he doesn't back a terrorist I really would... OK, but he said things in that... In, in no, 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 no. Jacob, I think you should probably retract that. OK, I'll retract that. You, don't, you don't know and you don't want to libel the man. Well, I certainly don't want to libel I certainly don't okay, want to libel him. But, 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 but let me just say, say another thing about it, because the newspaper that reported that, the Daily Telegraph, you may know, 
in 2018 had to pay out substantial damages to the Finsbury Park, uh, Finsbury Park okay. boss for libel against uh, against Mr Cosbar. Mr Cosbar, who... So you think... Uh, no, no, this is key, a really... No, 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 no. There is a very key point, because Mr Cosbar, who is being slandered here... OK, that's, wait, that's wait, really important. He, he, he was crucial in driving out okay. Abu Hamza from Finsbury Park that's Mosque. That's a so really this is important somebody point. somebody who is a key, has been a key ally against the kind of extremism that we're supposedly right. concerned with, and he's being slandered... So you're saying the Telegraph right story here. is simply wrong uh, and that uh, he hasn't... I, and, and, and you would not support him in backing Hamas, would you? I wouldn't support what him backing all? Hamas, but also poor, my poor understanding is, 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 is that he has not. And my point, okay. my, my point of scepticism no, is... No, that's really important. It, my point of is twofold. One, I have met him and this does not seem like him. Like and secondly, him. this newspaper has already had to pay out libel to his mosque for a, uh, for a story that... You're was an old Telegraph about. hand, Paul. But I was just going to say, I, I wasn't involved in this particular legal case, but if someone is on at friendly terms with the senior member of Hamas or they're associated with the Muslim Brotherhood in some way, of course they're not going to like Abu Hamza. I mean, Abu Hamza's out there with another group. So they would be trying to get their foothold in the mosque to get in their particular line. That doesn't mean the Muslim Brotherhood is a moderate organisation. And one has to be very careful about the company that is kept when they are terrorist organisations. Yes, but, I mean, there are no allegations that this man has kept any... No, but I mean, in any, terms of what you wrong, say and the words you used... And, I mean, in terms of talking to Hamas, I mean, we have former prime ministers of our country who have had meetings with Hamas. If we're ever going to have any peace in, uh, in West Asia, there are going to need to be all of the Palestinian political actors and all of the Israeli polit political actors, however distasteful we think they um, may be, however fascistic we might think uh, on uh, either side there might have elements of it. I think they need to, I they think will need to be part of it. This is a really interesting question about Hamas, because the Israelis do talk to Hamas, they do prisoner swaps, uh, and there are you know, diplomatic comings and goings with Hamas, but I think you've got to ask some very serious questions about where Hamas are now, because before October the 7th, it was possible, as I say, to believe they were heading towards a truce, you know, not a recognition of Israel, but a truce. You could open up and have some trade. They could get on top of Islamic Jihad. And, and Israel and Hamas would be able to rub along, as they sometimes are, between these um, periods of conflict. But Hamas took the initiative on October the 7th and went in and slaughtered a whole bunch of Israelis yeah, yeah. in horrendous circumstances, clearly to bust up the Abraham Accords and to get themselves back in the game. Thank you very much to my panel. Coming up next, foreign worker visas are set to double over the next five years according to internal Home Office documents. Why are we not taking back control? Oh, and why is a rotten cheese like a strong man? The answer later. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. To join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Where did you? It's my new teeth. Your new teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest. Always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's watching. 
Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Who is it? We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Welcome back. I remain Jacob rees and you've been getting in touch with your thoughts. Ian says, Jacob, a ceasefire isn't a ceasefire if only one side ceases hostility. That's quite a tongue twister, really. So unless Hamas was prepared to ceasefire, it wouldn't be one. Uh, yesterday, The Telegraph reported that foreign worker visas are set to double over the next five years for skilled jobs in occupations in which there are labour shortages, in spite of constant promises to bring down immigration. Why have the politicians lost control? This is no doubt being driven by a mixture of Treasury orthodoxy and the Office for Budget Responsibility. More e immigration does mean more economic activity, which would be reflected in our GDP. But when you calculate it in terms of per capita GBT GDP, it doesn't work out to be increasing. In Britain, there are more than 5 million people on out-of-work benefits, which is obviously a waste of their potential. And we don't need more migration to fill our labour market. We have millions of people who could be filling these jobs if we adjusted the incentives and helped them find opportunities. Well, my panel's with me to carry on this discussion, the editor of Conservative Home and former Tory MP Paul Goodman and the former advisor to Jeremy Corbyn, James Schneider. Paul, Come on, we promised in 2010, I hope you don't mind me saying we, because you're identifiable as a Tory, um, that we get down to the tens of thousands, and now we've got some document from the Home Office that's going to get it up to half a million. This is ridiculous, isn't it? It's how much are well, our... Extremist, populist, reactionary, these are all words thrown at Conservative government since 2010, but actually the great unwritten secret of this government is it's running probably the most liberal immigration policy in recent years, possibly in history. Um, I mean, after all, as you say, I left in 2010, you've been in Cabinet and you've seen it all happen. And I think the reason, post-Brexit, is uh, Boris Johnson really had quite well, liberal instincts on migration. And then, you know, as you, as you correctly said, uh, he inherited a model uh, of economic activity that very much is reliant on mass immigration, which we've had since the era of Tony Blair. And, and, James, um, I mean, the problem with mass migration is that actually it reduces the wages of the least well-off. It's fine for the highly paid, but it outcompetes those who are the poorest in society. Therefore, from a Labour point of view, isn't it something that should be brought under control? Well, <clears throat> I think you're looking at it the wrong way round. I mean, in your uh, set-up for this piece, you said there are lots of people out of work, they need to be helped back, uh, back into work. But the problem is that they're not. When you speak to employers, especially big employers, employers in manufacturing, a thing that they often say is that um, workers aren't coming out with the out of school, out of education, with the skills that they need. So if you want to genuinely help those people into employment, then it's going to cost money. You have to give them the skills and the training and offer retraining and reskilling and lifelong, lifelong education to people. And that's something which no one in the, in the government has been remotely interested in doing. It's actually something that was a Labour policy when Jeremy Corbyn was leader, but otherwise it hasn't been. So rather than viewing this as there is this threat from outside, we have an issue that, uh, that, that people in, in Britain are not, being, are not being equipped in the way in which they should be. OK, well, there's two, two things. There. One is the um, literacy figures have gone shooting up. It's one of the successes of the government. And the other that Boris Johnson introduced and saw passed the lifelong learning guarantee, which gives people a pot of money to retrain and re-educate when they're older. Both of these things are what you're asking for. So this is happening. 
well, it's clearly not happening in, Enough. in, in sufficiently well, large amounts. I think my understanding is the lifelong guarantee hasn't come in yet. Um, it, it will. It, it'll be very helpful. But um, I think there is a serious point here, which is that really you've got to look at it by sector. So, for example, if your complaint is um, in social care, we've become too reliant on people coming in from abroad to do the jobs, then actually, rather heretically, I agree with James. You have to take your domestic population, you have to train them up, and that will cost some money. And you have to pay them more. Yes. Uh, but that also leads to innovation and to um, greater use of uh, intelligence and automation, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, the employers are reluctant to pay more, but the Treasury, and this is part of the point you made in your opening, uh, they're reluctant to spend some of the money on the skills training that you need to spend. So there is this dilemma written into it that um, it, I think immigration is too high. Um, public polling does show that's generally the view and seems pretty sensible. But you can't just wish it away. You have to have a plan to reduce it over time. You can't do it faster than that because these things are under the government's control. Can't you simply raise the threshold at which people can come in uh, as being qualified? Well, and that's the debate that's going on, as I understand it, between the Home Office and the Treasury, the Home Office and Suella Bravman are you know, perpetually putting arguments to the Treasury like why have we abandoned the requirement for firms to look uh, for recruitment here first before applying abroad? And I, I think the, the Home Office has got a point. And what would the Labour Party do? Would it carry on with mass migration before it managed to implement what you're suggesting? Uh, or would it recognise how unpopular this is and do more than we've managed to do? I mean, I'm not a spokesperson. No, I know, the, but you know the, them for, quite for, well. For the current uh, Labour Party, who I imagine, judging by their current statements would carry on a pretty similar policy to the to the to to your government which is to um, talk in occasionally really rather unpleasant ways engage in a bit of victimization of this group or that group and do fundamentally very little uh, along the lines that you know we're, we're both able to agree on some of the things that, that that should be done to boost the the skills and earning capacity of people that are already here and are the small boats just a diversionary tactic because compared to the numbers coming in legally, the small boats are, if you'll excuse the pun, a drop in the ocean. In terms of numbers, yes, but there's an important point of principle here, which is what I think gets your constituents and other people worked up, which is you either have borders or you or don't. You don't. Um, and a prerequisite of having a, a, a nation state is you have borders. So that's the reason why people get so worked okay. up about it, even though the numbers are relatively small. Well, thanks for my panel. I promise you they're an intellectual panel and they've lived up to billing. Uh, coming up next, a friend from Just Top Oil is waiting in the wings for a friendly discussion. Plus, this evening's denouement is unbelievable. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought <laughs> we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. Bellissima. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Tired of the usual focus tested, pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? In your mouth. OK. Here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. I continue to identify as Jacob Rees-Mogg, and you've been getting in touch with your mail, Moggs. Peter, we don't want migration, legal or illegal. We want expats, where the employer pays salary, rent, health and travel. No extended families unless the employer pays. And this can apply to doctors, engineers and fruit pickers. And when the contract is up, thank you and goodbye. The host country pays nothing with no access to benefits. Do as I say, not as I do, the prerogative of the hypocrite through the ages. Research by the Times reveals that the supposed young activists are doing less to reduce their carbon footprint than older Britons. They're less likely to recycle, reduce flights and take steps to save water. The one thing that young people do do more of than their elders is they eat less meat. However, giving up your Sunday roast beef won't make much difference whereas our retired Britons are three times more likely to install energy-saving measures in their homes, perhaps because they pay their bills. So are the Thunbergs of the younger generation being overtaken by our pensioners for economic rather than virtue signalling reasons? Well, joining me now is James Skeed, spokesman from Just Stop Oil. James, thank you very much Thanks for coming. Very it's much nice to see me. you. Lovely to chat to you. Um, obviously, Just Stop Oil is campaigning to encourage young people to um, take this up. No, we're, what we're calling for is no new licences mm -hmm. or consents for any fossil fuel exploration in the UK. OK, but you're, you're more than that, aren't you? you, you you're worried about the climate emergency, as you call it, and um, when spokesmen have come on before, their concern has been about young people and protecting the young. So I think, why it's, do you I think, think it's all people, really, Jacob. I think, I think okay. this affects you as much as anyone else. All right, one of your predecessors who came on said that her concern was for my children, and so... Mm -hmm. I just wonder why you think it is that it's the older generation that seems to be doing more in terms of environment than the younger generation. Is it just political apathy amongst the young? I, th I think that there's a bit of a sort of classic GB News culture war framing here, to be honest, Jacob, because like what you're doing is sort of um, playing the young against the old. And while we're busy sort of talking with each other and getting distracted, that shows that we're not paying attention to this government that's gone ahead with licensing over 100 new fossil fuel projects, licensed Rosebank that's going to be emitting the, the emissions of 28 whole countries. Hmm. And I was trying to figure out why it is that there's so much money coming into GB News, you know, considering all the scandals, like all the sort of um, sexual misconduct that seems to be being undertaken by your presenters. And then I, I saw today that um, GB News's owner, uh, his hedge fund is invested in $2.2 billion in oil and gas. And do you think that potentially that um, an, a so-called news organisation that has investment to the tune of $2.2 billion in oil and gas might have a bit of a vested interest in manipulating the truth I have around no, oil I and have, gas. I have no investments uh, in I'm oil and gas. I'm not talking about you, but you work no, for an organisation that's got $2.2 billion investments in oil and gas. Your, your, point I, on, your point on exploration is a completely bogus one, because actually everyone accepts we're going to be using oil for the foreseeable future and gas, and that 2050 is net zero, not absolute zero, and that the emissions from yes, our... Yes, and 73% of Tory voters want... want the, uh, emissions, net zero. the emissions from our own resources are lower than those from resources that we import. This is partly Well, actually, 80%, as you well know, 80% yeah, yeah. of oil and gas is sold on the international it, market. Yes, so it does absolutely no, nothing reduces, for our energy security, it reduces, does it, Jacob? It, In fact, the best thing that we can uh, do on, for energy security making, uh, is to get off oil and gas. Different. You know that, don't you're you? You're answering a completely different question. 
the resources we use domestically are lower emissions. So you're actually causing, calling for higher we emissions. We sell it on the international the country, market, though, don't that we? Makes the country we don't less actually well use the UK's. Well, actually, the, uh, the, the, supply, the, the, the Rosebank field, they said a lot usable, of it will be used not domestically. Not actually usable in, because in UK we still, infrastructure. We still but more importantly, Jacob, the, the reason why we need to transition. We need to transition. Anywhere. You need to answer questions which you're trying to avoid. Using our energy well, why, resources uh, uh, cuts emissions. Answer me this, Jacob. Why should anyone listen to you when you're working for an organisation? that's got $2.2 $2 $2 billion dollars investments in oil and gas. Why, why would anyone believe you about using, anything that you say on this issue when you work for oh, an organisation that is invested in oil and gas? If you look at the chi climate and you, change, you yourself have said you're going to, you are going to has squeeze every drop of oil yeah, out of the North Sea. of doing that because the Climate Change Committee itself said on fracking that using our own resources reduced carbon emissions. So you're actually coming on here from Just Stop Oil. Why should anyone believe what you say? Carbon emissions. Why should anyone believe anything you say on this when I've just detailed how because you're working I'm for an organisation that is so for investments saying, in oil and gas? Saying, and if you are fed up of being lied to, if you are fed up of being lied to, <laughs> so, then I suggest that you go to JustStopOil.org, okay. sign saying, up for a slow march. I'm We're sure marching every that. day are throughout saying, November. Are you saying the Climate Change Committee is in the pocket of big oil? I'm saying that, um, well, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of uh, complicated um, so it's one thing investments to, say, don't to play, isn't me, it? So what, but you're what, saying what don't do, believe the climate... What I do think, what I do say, think so you're saying don't is that the Tory party took £3.5 million pounds okay. in what I'd like to call legalised bribes from the oil and gas lobby in 2022. So you're uh, saying... Rishi you're Sunak's saying, own father-in-law signed a $1.5 billion okay, dollar deal so with BP. We even have saying, Exxon Mobil yeah, yeah. have been funding the policy exchange, yes, which wrote the Public Order Act, which is taking away... All of our rights to speak out about this corruption Oil that we is all know is happening, and Jacob is facilitating. Economy. Aren't you, Jacob? We have a lot of Jacob, tax that your, comes from it. How do we get people about? What will your children say? My children what are you going to say to your children when they ask you, Daddy, what did you do to avert this crisis? What and you get say, to say to them that you went on national television say, and lied and lied I've told and lied. no lies. You're not. Hmm? You're just making accusations. You have no evidence for any untruth at all. You're casting aspersions with not one jot of evidence. You deny the Climate Change Committee. You want higher emissions by not using our own oil and gas. That's a you lie. want to stop the British economy. You want to make my That's children poor. Lie. You want to make the British voter cold and poor. And all you do I, is sit there. So and actually, use the so word this is lie. just another can misrepresentation, we have, actually. Can we have so some facts from just you? Up oil, a single just up oil, fact. Just a boil are calling for measures that will improve the livelihood okay. of all of your Thank listeners you into home installation, That's free great. public transport. Not a single fact. Energy that's so, Nine times cheaper. We're now, facts, I'm, facts. We're now, I'm glad to say, on to cheese. So, we're going on to why is a rotten cheese like a strong man? To which the answer is because it's mighty. A joke from the 18th century joke book when mites in cheese were more of a problem than today. To to Nonetheless, children, we are Jacob. pretty cheesed off to to by this unbelievable you, story which will crisis? rock the fort mm -hmm. out of our French Move friends' vanity who are probably the shrugging their shoulders Europeans and saying, what Lebec? Over the weekend, the World Seven Cheese Awards were held in, in Norway, week. and a Norwegian cheese the won their pasteurised blue Nidelven Blah we cheese. Tens of thousands of French and English cheeses didn't seem to get a look in, not even Pakistan. making the we top ten. Europe I suggest they run these competitions more carefully in future. But most importantly, Vox Populi, Vox Day, we asked the great people of Nottingham if they thought British cheese is the best, and the people have spoken. My favourite is probably um, cheddar. I'm not going to lie, yeah, just standard cheddar. Um, I'm not very much into the blue cheese and stuff like that, but I do like cheddar. I like a variety of cheeses, to be fair. Um, I think um, cheddar obviously always goes down very well. Um, and also Red Leicester also goes down very well. Um, but we're doing quite a lot of vegan varieties as well now, so that's a good option. But I like cheese that bites your back. I, I think that it's a, we let, you let us down attitude, we're not voting for your cheese from Europe. Well, now for the denouement, I'd be remiss if I didn't try a Norwegian, French and British cheese just to prove the point. But the key is, I have a bath of a biscuit, God's Own Biscuits, uh, from God's Own County. So this, I think, is a little bit of Somerset cheddar, which is absolutely tickety-boo, delicious. This may be the French cheese. Mmm, and here's the, I think, the funny Norwegian stuff, which I might just taste on its own. Well, 
Some of this is going to be my supper. It's going to be the Somerset Cheddar, as you might have guessed. Anyway, that's all from me. Up next is Mark Dolan, and I'm eating with my mouth full. Mark, what is on the bill of fare tonight? What a cheesy show tonight, Jacob, in all the right senses. Listen, we're very, very busy. We'll be talking about hate on Britain's streets, in my big opinion. At least the Home Secretary has had the courage to speak out. Will Madeleine McCann ever be found? And is a BBC star right that science is too white? A really busy show. We're live at nine. Oh, well, that sounds absolutely excellent and not in the least bit cheesy. That's coming up <laughs> after the weather. I'll be back tomorrow at eight o'clock. I'm Jake rees -Mogg. This has been State of the Nation, and I can tell you, over the weekend, the weather in Somerset was absolutely glorious, and as promised, we made the cider and we made the best part of 30 gallons. So, weather in Somerset's good for cider. Good evening, it's Alex Burkill here with your latest GB News weather forecast. And whilst for many the unsettled thing continues through the next 24 hours, it's a drier but chillier picture for Scotland. And that's because of a brief ridge of high pressure which is quietening the weather down a little bit here. Meanwhile, the rest of the UK under the influence of a low pressure centred over Republic of Ireland. That's bringing then heavy showery rain to many parts of England, Wales and particularly eastern parts of Northern Ireland. Heavy rain building up here overnight could be up to 100 100 millimetres perhaps, which is why some impacts are likely. Drier weather across parts of Scotland, a touch of frost likely here, milder further 